We're not going to start without you. Well, um, th this morning we have a, a really special morning. We're going to be honoring graduates. We have a special uh, guest speaker. But as always, the reason why we gather this morning is to put our attention on Jesus. Amen. Uh, let him capture your attention this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you right now in the name of Jesus. In awe of uh, who you are and what you have done and what you continue to do. We pray, Lord God, that you would uh, remove distractions. We, we surrender our distractions and our concerns to you this morning, that uh, our worship to you would be unobstructed. We desire to worship you and give you all of our heart's attention. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let, let's stand and worship the Lord this morning. You know, um, I've been inspired by the book of uh, Philippians, and one of the themes of that book is joy and having joy in spite of our circumstances because we know our God is in, is in control. And so because of that, we can worship him in joy. Greatest day in history Death is beaten, you have rescued me Sing it out Jesus is alive Empty cross, the empty grave now Life eternal, you have won the day Shout it out, Jesus is alive He's alive And oh, happy day, happy day You wash my sin Stand in that place, free at last, meeting face to face. I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. And this joy, perfect peace, earthly pain finally will cease. Celebrate, Jesus is alive.
Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before Thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. Your love has come here to dwell. All thy works with joy. Around thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee, center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea. Singing bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Join the happy chorus which the morning stars began. Father, love is reigning o'er us. Brother, love binds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward. Victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us sunward in the triumph song. Of life. Awesome. I love uh, that we have uh, such a talent pool here that uh, even when uh, Rachel isn't here, we don't miss a beat in worship and you bring the classics. <laughs> Let's continue to worship um, in our, with our offering. We take our offering during the middle of worship because we, we give from our hearts. It's an act of worship. Father God, we proclaim at this time your faithfulness, your goodness. All that we need will come from you. All that we have has come from you. Every good thing is from you. Lord, we, we ask you to receive this, this offering from our, our hearts, and uh, we give to you as cheerful hearts so that you would bless it and use it for the purposes that you have called us to. We unite right now, Lord, uh, in, under, your, under your roof for your purposes to do your will. Thank you, Lord, for all that you give us. It's an abundance. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? Is a new creation coming? It is. is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone 
Song. 
reign above all, regardless of what circumstances are going on in our lives right now. And I know that a lot of us are dealing with hardships that aren't obvious and aren't seen, ailments in our bodies and circumstances that we don't have solutions to. But you are sovereign over it, Lord. We understand that and we uh, profess that this morning. We pray, Lord, that our heart of worship right now, our, our thoughts of worship would remain, that you would protect them that you yourself would, would guide them even beyond uh, this time of singing and into uh, the rest of this day and the rest of this week. That when we encounter and have to deal with the situations of life, we would continue to worship you, praise you, and, and, and trust you. We proclaim this morning together that we trust you, we love you, and we look forward to um, the word that you'll bring to us this morning. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So you're, you can be seated. I only have a couple of announcements for you right now. And I'm sorry that I can't do it as dynamic as Kim. She is on vacation, just like a lot of people this morning um, are on vacation. It's, we're going into to summer, so there it is. But here, here's what we have to look forward to next week. It's our kids camp. It's our kids camp. It's one of the biggest things that we'll do all year. And uh, we're looking forward to it. We still have work to pour into it. So we're asking all of you to help. It's not uh, something that we um, will try to do lightly. We, we want to go big on this, so we, so we need your help. If you are interested in helping in any way, even if you think you're not a kid's person, but you are good at helping those that are helping the kids, okay? Just see um, Eric. Eric is, is right there. We have our table in the lobby to see in different ways you could help or, or even donate items that are needed. Um, Eric's uh, our director of kids ministry. His contact information is on the back of your bulletin. But also be joining us in prayer. This uh, Thursday, we have our Oasis Night of Worship. And during that time, we're going to um, highlight the kids ministry and pray for it. So I want to invite each and every one of you. Will you Will you make time this Thursday to join us so that we could collectively as a church pray for our kids camp? This is an outreach. It's not just for our kids. It's, we're reaching the kids of our, our neighborhood and our community. So um, take an invite with you uh, this morning and, and, and extend it to as many kids as possible. Tell their parents about it too, by the way. That's just a good process there. Okay. Um, the other thing I, I want to let you know, in case you're 
probably aren't wondering, I started to grow a little mustache here, okay? And that's, that's not to look weird, but it's actually part of the kids' camp. It's going to be part of the character I'm going to be in during kids' camp. You'll have, now do you want to help out? Now do you want to go? I'm sure by then, by next week, this will be nice and bushy because I'm manly that way, okay? This is what happened. Okay, this has been, I've been growing this for a few months. But, um, but by next week, it'll be nice and thick. So be praying for the, the kids uh, next week. In addition to that, follow our, um, our link, our, it's a, what's it called? A link tree. That's it. There's cards in front of you, or you could scan that, and that gives you all the information you need to know about what's on our calendar, events, and our different events and uh, key dates and our ministry. So with that, I want to um, commission you all to be our greeters this morning. Greet one another. Take about 90 seconds to say hello to people across the room. Yes, Holly. Oh, live scan. Next. Thank you, Holly. Next Sunday after church, we are doing a live, a live scan operator will be coming in to make sure he gets everybody live scanned, especially those that are working with kids. So, um, that's, that's going to be something that we provide. So look forward to that and make a, a point of doing that. Okay. Get up and greet each other. Something else? You have to have your ID. Get up and anything else? No. Okay. Get up and greet each other. Kids, you can find your teacher and, and follow. Something special we want to do today is, um, is acknowledge and, uh, and pray for and, and honor our, our graduates. We have, we have two graduates uh, here this morning that have been part of the Lighthouse family for a very long time. They're graduating high school. And I think they're, yes. And I, I do believe they're both uh, going on to become uh, doctors and engineers and the presidents, the next presidents of the United States. Uh, we might just write your names in there. But can, can you guys go ahead and come up so that we, even if you're shy, come on, come on up, you guys. Yes. Receive your honor. Come on up, you guys. Front and center. So this is... <laughs> This is Cademan and, and, and Joy, and you guys are officially graduated, right? No, no not, not quite yet. Uh, Joy is, and Cademan, when do you graduate? Like in a week. Uh, in a week. Well, it sounds good enough. Yeah, you got it. Just It's a bunch of um, half days and field trips anyway. All right. Okay, so, um, so Cademan and Joy, you guys have been part of the Lighthouse family for a long time, since you were little, right? You, you, you grew up here. And we've been able to, to get to see you grow. Even myself, I've been here only two and a half years. I've, I've seen you guys grow as well. There they are. Look at that. Oh, my goodness. Did you know that was happening, Cademan? Look at that, boy. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Solid. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we, I, on behalf of the church, I, I just want to take some time to pray for you guys and to, to honor you guys, oh my gosh, Joy, look at that. Yes, heart. What is happening with that hair? That is amazing. <laughs> That's just in the morning, first shot, snapshot. <laughs> that was definitely, so you've been cool. <laughs> so you've been cool for a very long time, ever since then. <laughs> so we want to just uh, express um, our love and support to you guys and, and, and say that although you're graduating and you might be going off to college or, or different pursuits of life, different directions, that you always have a home here, that you will always be thought of and prayed for and loved here. That, that, will, never, that will never end. And we'll always be thinking about you. And we hope that we, yes, and, uh, and we want to see you all the time. Lighthouse Church has, you've been an integral part of it, and it wouldn't be the same without you. And uh, it's not just, it's, and it's one of the things I appreciate about here, here at Lighthouse. It's not just an adult thing and kids or youth ministry. It's all, it's all together. Every time we've had events, uh, you guys have been part of it a, as well. And I want to give you a, a chance, even if you're shy, to just say anything that you'd like to say about uh, what's next for you, what you appreciate about Lighthouse, or anything at all. And I'll start with you, Joy. So basically, um, two days, I'm going to be doing a summer internship at uh, the YMCA with uh, kids 
And Joy is awesome with kids. You've been a big part of our kids' ministry, and it's been more than just watching the kids, but it's part of, you, you've been part of the fellowship in there on, on the team, and, and that's, that's been wonderful. Cademan, you don't have to, but is there anything that you want to say about what's next or any sentimental feelings you want to share? Sure, sure. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mom, and thank you, Dad. <laughs> wow. If you know Cademan, that was very expressive. That was very expressive, and I hope you were. I hope that's on recording. It's recorded. All right. Well, um, everybody, will you join me in praying for uh, Cademan and Joy? Father God, we thank you for bringing Joy and Cademan into the world, and into the Lighthouse Church family. We thank you for your hand being on them from birth until now. And we pray, Lord, as they continue to seek you, follow you, and be led by you, that they'll grow in the grace and knowledge of who you are, Jesus. We pray that wherever they go, that you would send them, your people, your servants who know you and love you, to love them and support them. We pray as they grow older and continue different pursuits, that knowledge and understanding of your grace would grow. We pray, Lord, and give them to you, dedicate them to you, that wherever they go, you would protect them from the enemy's distractions and distortions of who you are. We pray that you would guide them and lead them into who you have ordained them to be. We pray for their safety, the safety of their soul and their spirit, Lord. They go into a dangerous world, but we pray that you would equip them and strengthen them for what lies ahead. And we pray also, Lord, that you would remind us and protect the thoughts about them uh, within our congregation, that we would continue to pray for them and uh, lift them up to you. For this we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks a lot, you guys. Hey, how about a big congratulations? And thank you for coming. Thanks for coming up here, you guys. Awesome. Well done. <laughs> All right, well, um, at, at, please uh, continue to um, support them, encourage them uh, th throughout the morning, except for during the message part. Um, but there is a, a, a card and a book uh, that um, Lena has that's going to be circulating so that you could sign it and maybe uh, write a note of encouragement as well, and that'll be available after we dismiss, okay? Uh, I want to bring up our guest speaker this morning. He's a friend of mine and, uh, and just a... Uh, a, a great contributor and, and somebody who builds up the, the body of Christ in many different ways. He has had several uh, positions of leadership that, that do so. Uh, he's a, a scholar and a friend, a regular guy, and a, and a, and a, and a wonderful brother in, in Christ. Will you guys please welcome David Nystrom, Dr. David Nystrom. Good morning. Yeah, I am a doctor. <laughs> so if you want to know, I got my PhD um, a long time ago in two areas, Roman social history and New Testament theology. Sounds totally fun, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I was, I was just really interested in not just the New Testament, but, but the social context. Um, so just, just as an example, um, apart from Jews, in the first century, and Christians, um, nobody had belief or trust in the gods. If you think about the gods of Greek and Roman mythology, they're like giant, all-powerful, irresponsible 12-year-olds. You know, I mean, you wouldn't want to trust your life to them. And so what happens is, you know, if something goes wrong, you, you've inadvertently done something to upset some god, and then you just figure out, how can I bribe them to take it easy on me? And that's religion. And so when Paul comes along, or Jesus comes along, and, and the word gets out to the Roman world, it takes people a long time to figure out what they're talking about. Does that make sense? And so the letters in the New Testament, particularly those of Paul, have that 
have that uh, interaction. And so we're going to look at Philippians today because you're going to start a, uh, a series on Philippians. And Rosendo has asked me to do an overview. So that's what, we're gonna, that's what I'm going to try to do. And I'm going to try to do it in, like, before the big hand gets to the bottom of the clock. And so if we get close and you start feeling like I'm talking too long, then go ahead and raise your hand and tell me to speed up. OK, so here's Philippi. Um, so this is like Athens would be here. Uh, here. Uh, so Philippi is uh, you know, pretty far north uh, in, in ancient Greece, in present day Greece. So this is perhaps the most intimate and affectionate of the letters we have from Paul to a congregation. If you think about it, sometimes he's upset at a congregation. Sometimes he's introducing himself. But this is, uh, this is a, these are people that he's close to. They love him. They encourage him. So uh, it's extremely warm. And it's possible there was no group to which Paul felt more connected than this group. And it was addressed to the Christians there in Philippi and Macedonia. And according to Acts, they're the first uh, congregation in Europe to be established by Paul. He seems to have only happy warm relations with them, and they had sent him money and supplies uh, when he was elsewhere in Greece. So, I mean, they're, they're a supporting congregation. And when they heard of his imprisonment in Rome, they sent... Epaphroditus, their messenger, to him with supplies and just to express how much they love him and how much they're concerned for him. So the date is maybe 62 AD. Now, Paul probably was executed under Nero 66, 67. Uh, we don't really know that. At the end of his life, the chronology gets a little bit murky because, as you know, the book of Acts ends with him in Rome and then just stops. doesn't talk about the end of his life or what happens to him in Rome. So we don't know for sure what happens next. It's possible he was set free and then rearrested. It's pretty clear he was executed about 67 in Rome under Nero, um, who is one of the worst human beings ever. After spending time in Rome with Paul, uh, Epaphroditus wanted to return to Philippi. We read that in the second chapter. So Paul took the opportunity to send the church in Philippi this letter, born, carried by this guy Epaphroditus. And there's an irrepressible, radiant joy about the letter even though he's under some form of arrest. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. He's in prison, he's under, you know, he's under arrest, and he's got a joyful message. That's incredible. I mean, think how, think how easy it is for us to get not joyful. And it contains a significant statement about Christ, particularly chapter 2. It's one of the two primary passages in Paul that tell us what he thinks, his estimate of Jesus Christ. The other one is Colossians 1. So here's the main, here's the money passage. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, even though he was in the form of God, he didn't count equality with God something to be, and the Greek word means something like taken advantage of. Yep, he's God, but he willingly took on human form. He willingly emptied himself. I mean, who would do that? That's the love God has for us. Um, he didn't think it a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself to the form of a certain being, born in the likeness of human beings. I mean, found in human form, he humbled himself even further and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God is highly exalted and bestowed in the name which is above every name. So this is a, this is a famous passage. But if you, I mean, just let that sink in. God, the Son of God, the, the one of the Trinity, said, I'm going to assume human form. And when we say that, we don't mean human like us. We live subhumanity. We, li we, mean, we mean human like Adam. Adam as he should have been. Does that make sense? Before the fall. But he lived that the way we were supposed to live so that the route would be open that we could regain that place because of his death and resurrection on our behalf. So once again, there's a uh, little bit more about the, the general area. Uh, here's, the ancient, here's the site of ancient Philippi. There's a, a, a stadium there. Uh, uh, there's actually a, a second century church right here. So it's not a huge site as uh, ancient sites go. And that is, um, that's the site of a second century church. So Paul never saw that. 100 years, 150 years later. 
Okay, so the letter should have been read, would have been read on a Sunday morning. Read out loud to the entire congregation. So I'm going to propose that we do that. Put your seatbelts on. Here we go. <laughs> Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. So the words there are uh, like episcopoi, like episcopal, episkopos, and, uh, and, the, and it's just the word for deacon. Grace and peace to you. I thank God by God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's right for me to feel this way about you, since I have you in my heart. Whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. It's my prayer that your love may abound more and more in all knowledge and depth of insight. So the knowledge is the smarty pants stuff, and the depth of insight is, un is actually understanding, understanding people, understanding situations. So it's my prayer that your love may abound more and more in all knowledge and depth of insight so that you are able to uh, and this is a, it's a very hard word to translate into English. It, this is not so great. Uh, you may discern what is best. Uh, the word is ta uh, diaferonta, do the things that really matter. Like the word adiaphora in English means unimportant. Adiaphora. So ta diaphora, do the things that really matter. Be thoughtful. Be reflective. Don't just be spasmodic. Think about What's the most important thing to do in this moment? What do I have the energy for? What do I, what do I need to do to prepare for what's coming uh, around the corner? I often think that the most important thing is, involves ice cream in some way, shape, or form. This is my prayer. Let me about more and more in all knowledge that the events that you may prove, may be able to discern what is, uh, what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what happened to me has actually started to advance the gospel. As a result, it's been clear that the whole palace guard. So, I mean, he's in prison, right? This is awesome. The gospel's been advanced because I'm in prison. As a result, it has become clear that the whole palace guard and everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. That's remarkable. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, and other, but others out of goodwill. The latter uh, do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. What does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, by, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body whether by life or by death for to me to live is Christ to die is gain if I am to go on living in the body that will mean fruitful labor for me yet what shall I choose I don't know I'm torn between the two I desire to depart and be with Christ which is better by far but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress. I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. And that by God. It has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, 
since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So now chapter 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, of any comfort from his love, of any common sharing in the spirit, of any tenderness and, com and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others more highly than yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you should pay attention. Look to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mind as in Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. By the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue your work to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's an interesting turn of phrase, right? Work out your salvation. In fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Let me just as an aside about work out your salvation. Maybe you've noticed that there is a triple pattern of salvation in the New Testament. We have been saved. For those of us who have been saved, is the power of God. We are in the process of being saved, Paul can write. And Paul can also say, our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. It has that past, present, and future, all three elements. Past, what Christ has accomplished for us, saves us. We can't do it ourselves. Nothing we can do on ourselves. But there's also the process of then growing in godliness. So that's the our being saved part. And then the will be saved is that's, you know, at the end of time. Does that make sense? It's, it's, all, it's all three of those. So then you will shine like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I'll be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am poured out like a drink offering on the, sacri uh, on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you, too, should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you soon, that I, may, that I also may be cheered and when I, receive news, when I receive news about you. I don't have anyone else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everybody looks at their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier who also with who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. In fact, he was ill, almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. That'd be good, right? Less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Okay, chapter 3. Further, brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision. So, there was, a, there was a schismatic group in early Christianity who said to be, really be a Christian, you have to be fully Jewish. So demanding circumcision. And that would, Paul would understand that as a work. And so he's, he's upset at those folks. For it is we were the circumcision. We who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Even though I am 
reasons for that confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, if, if someone else wants to make that case, that being get to be fully Jewish in order to be a Christian, guess what? I've got all of them beat. <laughs> well, let me tell you about me. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church for right, as for righteousness, based on the law, I'm faultless. <laughs> so, I mean, he, he's making the case. Boy, if somebody wants to make Judaism, you have to be Jewish, fully Jewish, in order to be a Christian, I've got way more credentials than any of them. And I'm saying, no, they're wrong. But whatever were gains to me now, I consider for loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. That's really what he says. <laughs> garbage. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. What do I want? I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation. I, I also want to participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I've already obtained it or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, I strain forward like a, like a, like a, uh, a husky that's just, just straining you know, on, on, the, on the yoke to pull that sled. I strain forward, and I forget what's behind. I press on to where the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature, we ought to also take that same view. And if some, on some point you think differently, well, okay, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I've often told you before, and I'll tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is their destruction, their God is their stomach, <laughs> and their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. So it's a, that's a powerful idea. Uh, 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 so Paul can call us, the Greek would be uranapolitai. We are, uranos is the Greek word for heaven. We're citizens of heaven. I don't know if you, I mean, we, we, our loyalty as Christians is to God and his kingdom. That's number one. We're all citizens of heaven. That's our primary loyalty, Paul says. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Okay, last chapter. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these two women since they have contended on my side for the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced greatly. You know, he just said, it. I'm coming to the end, and he keeps writing. Yeah. <laughs> I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. 
Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except for you. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I've received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering, acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. That's the end. So that, that would have been read for the first time you know, by Epaphroditus to that congregation in Philippi. So we've just had the opportunity to sort of relive that. So what, what strikes you? What did you notice? How did you feel? Yeah, isn't it? It's deeply personal. I mean, you, you can tell he, he knows these people. He loves them. What else strikes you? He loves the Lord deeply. Yeah. He loves the Lord deeply. I mean, I, I would, I don't, I don't mind if I'm persecuted. <laughs> I think, well, I'm kind of funny mind a little bit if that happened. You know, my goodness. I mean, he loves the, I mean, he's totally sold out. He's really clear about what, the, what his priorities are. Very good. What else? Yeah, he's, he's got, yeah, he's, he's got gratitude. He has a deep relationship with the Lord. Anything else strike you? He wants something. He, he wants the Philippians to have the fullness of the Lord. Yeah, he and really. He himself. Yeah, he really desires that they grow and they and they live into this, this, this possibility that God opens for us that we can know the living God. So why, why are we too distracted? <laughs> So let's take a look at two passages. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So overseers, and we talked about this, episkopois and deacons, diakonois, those are the typical words. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you, I always pray for you with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's right for me to feel this way about you all, all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. This is my prayer, that you're loving me about more and more in all knowledge and discernment, that you'll be able to discern what is best, prove what is excellent, and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Any reflections just on that passage? So I pray for you. Here I am in prison, and I'm praying for you. <laughs> I'm thankful for you. We're co-workers. Let's not forget that we're connected. You know, the, the scriptures talk about the Christian community as the body of Christ, and that we are connected and we need one another. Now, if I'm anesthetized, and the surgeon cuts you know, has to cut out something from my arm, just because I don't feel the pain doesn't mean I'm not being injured, right? So if we don't feel the connection we have with one another, it's not because we don't have that connection. It's because we're anesthetized to it. Does that make sense? Because when we become Christians, we become part of a bigger, broader community. Our primary citizenship is in heaven, and we are, we are connected, interdependent on one another. But if we don't notice it, that doesn't change the fact that, that we are, in fact, connected. So we're, we're connected, and we're connected to something important, something that involves courage, something that involves thought, reflection, insight, discern what is best, ta diaferonta. 
figure out what the important thing is. Make priorities. What do I, what do I need to do today? So I, you know, I wake up in the morning and I say, oh yeah, this is the day I said I was going to change the oil in the car and clean out the garage. But I, I walk out of my bedroom and, I, and, I, and like, uh, my house is on fire. But I say, well, you know, I said I was going <sighs> to clean up my bedroom and clean out the garage, so I'm going to do that. Right? I mean, figure out what's important in the moment, but also what's important long term. Do the stuff that really matters. Confidence. He began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Confidence in what? Not just yourself, but confidence in God. You know, remember the parable of the lost sheep? You know, we're the sheep. We're lost. But God is looking for us. We don't have to find him. The idea is quit hiding. Does that make sense? So figure out whatever you're doing that's, that's essentially hiding, that's staying away. God's looking for you. Quit hiding. God has something in mind for you. Will you be available? What's he forming in you? To all your experiences, the, through the gifts and talents and, and, and abilities he's given you. And Paul is in chains, and he's suffering, and he's still saying, there's something out there. There's something that God asked me that, that this experience, even though I'm in prison, I'm in chains, is actually preparing me for that. That your love may abound in all knowledge, smarty pants, but also insight given by the Spirit. So that means reason reflection. Remembering whose you are and who you are and to whom you're connected, and to what you're called. So there's a good deal of thoughtfulness and kindness and connection and a call to pay attention. So um, this guy, Theodore Adorno, uh, born in Germany, Jewish, became a professor, part of the Frankfurt School of Sociology. In the early 30s, he left Germany, because you could see what was going on there with, with Hitler, ended up in... Uh, Los Angeles. And he studied modern consumer capitalism and the problems it creates. He loved freedom, and he worried about the forces that limited it. So he's not against capitalism. He's against consumer capitalism, the kind of, the kind of world that says, you need the next thing. Rolling stones, right? I can't get no satisfaction. I buy something, it's a, it's a hot thing, I have it, I have it for a week, and then the next hot thing comes along, and so I'm constantly uh, uh, upset, constantly uncertain, because I can never have enough. And what Adorno said is, man, if, if we live in the West, if we live in the United States or in Europe, we are so lucky, because we have reached a place economically where we can have, we're not, we're not just trying to survive all the time, we can be reflective and say, what is my life really about? What ought I to be doing? How, I, how ought I to organize, to order my priorities? That just right in line with what we just heard from Paul. But what he said is, consumer capitalism says, no, I, we, we, wanna, we want you to always think you don't have enough. That was his analysis. He thought a lot about suntans and drive through burger joints. <laughs> and what he came to see is that consumer culture, not, not capitalism, but consumer capitalism, that you always need the next thing, that you, you're never content because you always, there's always something else you need to have, that that actually limits freedom. Isn't that interesting? He felt our free time and great gifts should be spent bettering ourselves, reading books, seeing films that help us understand ourselves in the world. Instead, we have fallen into the hands of the entertainment machine, he said. Where we're constantly, we got, we're constantly un, uncertain, we don't think deeply. And that wants to keep us distracted, wants to give us a short attention span, and it wants, really wants to just make money off us. He felt it deeply malevolent. He called it the culture industry. And it caused us to live in an open prison. 
And he thought Walt Disney was the most dangerous person in America. <laughs> because he was selling entertainment. Selling don't think deeply. Even things like, even things like, the, like the, uh, Disney's uh, reordering uh, of, 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 nur of nursery stories were less complex than the originals. So and it, it's no one person, but isn't that the culture we live in, where we're constantly distracted? We constantly move? I feel that way. I, I, I don't need anything new, but, I, but, but those commercials are at work in the, in, the, you know, in the recording loop of my brain. So these are Tom's shoes you get online for like 30 bucks. I wore them last week to preach and I remember putting them on thinking, I should get another pair. I really don't need them. This pair's fine. I don't need another pair for a year. But I was like, I went online just last Sunday, like, how much do they cost? Is, 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 are you like me? Does it have that power over us? So just think about how, what, what Paul is saying here. I want you to be thoughtful. Have the time to be thoughtful. Have the, have, the, have the connection to the Spirit that you're paying attention. And what would Christ have us do? Don't be manipulated by the culture around you. So don't allow yourself to be distracted. Stick it out in suffering. God can be at work in you. Being thoughtful, not distracted about yourself. Being thoughtful. What might God have for me today? That's what ought to be important to us. And if you need wisdom and patience, Paul says... Ask God to help you and grant you the opportunities to learn patience and to learn wisdom. Okay, the second passage. We're almost done. I have four minutes, I think, according to my calculation. Is that what I said? <laughs> Whatever it were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the passing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For who, isn't this beautiful? For whose sake I've lost all things. I consider all that stuff before garbage. That I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings becoming like him. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I don't think of myself as yet having taken hold of it. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So what was a gain by my old standard, by the world standards, I now think was a horrible loss. So what do we in practice try to gain? I want to know the power of his resurrection and to participate with him in his suffering, right? Isn't that what you think every day? Like, what could I do today that would cause me suffering? <laughs> like, I'm going to call some friends, like, what would cause the most suffering, and let's go do that. Let's go have a suffering trip. Where would we go to maximize our suffering today? That's an odd order. I want to know the power of his resurrection, and I want to participate in, with him in his suffering. We would put it the other way around, right? I'm suffering. I want to know the power of the resurrection to get out of the suffering. But Paul puts it not that order. He says, I want to know the power of the resurrection so that I will be able to endure the suffering that will help me get rid of me and have more of Jesus in me. Wouldn't you think that with a resurrection victory there would be the victory lap? But here, suffering comes after victory. That's just, that's a mind bender. Suffering comes after victory. The stuff I long for, the stuff I allowed myself to fall in love with, to which I was addicted. Augustine wrote these lines. Be careful what you love. Because we become subject to the things we love. And subjects cannot judge. So when we suffer, when we suffer,
either we lash out and we blame others, and then we get smaller. It's everybody else's fault, totally innocent, I did nothing to deserve this. And you start seeing other people as the enemy. Or we reflect and we say, what was my part in this? Maybe, maybe it was totally unjust, but what was, what was my part in this? What can I learn? And when we do that, we discover that what we really desire is not the superficial stuff. We don't really desire another pair of Tom's $30 slip-ons. <laughs> what we really desire is the deeper stuff. I want, I want to know my wife, Christina, even more deeply. We've married 42 years. I want to know her more deeply. I want to know my, my family, my friends more deeply. I don't, want to be, I don't want to be a person who has an attention span of five minutes and then my brain is thinking about something else. What do we read? We don't want the superficial stuff. When we suffer, we develop empathy for others. We realize that we should not despair, that we're in God's hands. Ambrose, a um, little bit older than Augustine, uh, was the Bishop of Milan, which was then the capital of Rome, the Roman Empire. He, before he was a, when he was a very old man and, and had maybe a week to live, he was asked if he was afraid of death, and he said, we have a good master. I don't know the future, but I know the Lord. And the last thing is, Paul's running to this church that he knows well, that loves him, he loves, and he says, remember, we're a body. We need one another. So I'd like you to look around, look, look, at, look people in the eye. This is, this is your home. This is, your, this is the body of Christ here. So, let's try to live into these truths just a little bit more each day. More, Lord Jesus, of you and your will and purpose, less of me. Amen? Thank you. Um, I, I, on that note, uh, David, would you all uh, agree that this was a, a rich, deep teaching? Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Nystrom is, uh, has been a professor for a long time and has taught others how to, to teach, so you could see that come out. But on that note, we're, we're one body, right? And uh, as much as you have given us to us this morning, we would like to pray for you. Thank you. Can, can we uh, join uh, and, and pray for Dr. Uh, Nystrom? Uh, he, you, God can call, has, you, you can call me Dave. If Dave, you, yeah. If you want, yeah. He likes to be called Dave, Dr. Dave. I mean, just Dave. <laughs> uh, he has too many letters after his name. Um, but he, God has been using uh, Dave in so many different capacities and settings to disciple and build um, up the body in ways that none of us will see, but will feel and experience because we're all one. And, uh, and your journey ahead of you is, uh, is in God's hands. So let's pray for that. Father God, we thank you for our brother here. We thank you for bringing him here. We thank you for the friendship and the, the family you've made out of us. We thank you for all that you have poured into his life. Um, even the suffering that, um, the, suffer, the outcome of that suffering is our blessing this morning. Lord, we pray that you would, you would give Dave strength, wisdom, insight to be able to discern what is best in the months ahead, in the weeks ahead, and, and yes, the years ahead. We pray, Lord, that you would give him uh, just a fruitfulness for everything, with everything he puts his hand to do for you as it blesses the rest of us and uh, the body of Christ around him. Lord, we pray that you would protect his heart and mind, that your joy uh, would be poured in, protect him from the distractions that he spoke about and the distractions of, uh, that the enemy tries to throw at him. We pray that you would bless his marriage and his family, that you would continue to pour love into them. We pray that uh, he and his wife would enjoy fellowship with you, Lord. 
and uh, closeness and intimacy with you together. And we pray that they would hear your singing over them. Thank you, Lord, for this man and our brother. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Close in worship here. Uh, I just want to invite you guys to uh, consider everything that the Lord has, has spoken to you personally. Everything that he has said to you um, through the reading of the book of Philippians. Uh, I guess I'm done with the series now. Um, <laughs> the, the, whole, the whole book has been thoroughly um, <laughs> uh, preached. But um, let, us, let us engage the Lord right now in, in freedom and in joy. Pray with me. Father God, we thank you for the seeds that you have sown this morning. We pray that you protect them from every distraction and every attempt of the enemy to steal them. We worship you, Lord, and uh, we want to discern what is best, make you most important, and in every way, think about the other for your glory and your honor. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand one more time to give praise to our Lord this morning. Every time I come running, I find grace on repeat. You welcome me with open arms, no matter where I have been. Every time I surrender, every time I fall, I find grace more precious than I did before. So I'm gonna lay my world down here at your feet.
He's a God who's never given up on us. Amen. Let's leave here with that encouragement. Um, although you're not exactly leaving because it is our biannual church meeting. Okay. And there's a, a few things you need to know about that. Three things to do. Rob, tell me if I missed something here. Um, you're going to get in line to receive a, a ballot uh, for, for members to vote. Uh, you'll get in line to get your food as soon as that is uh, readied. And what was the third thing? Tables and chairs. Oh, we yeah. Need to turn this yes, place we need, around. We need, we're going to put tables down, so we'll need your help to, to move the chairs around, stack them, and move them um, uh, off off the center so we can bring the tables in. The other thing, uh, for our graduates, make sure that you honor them and say hello to them. Uh, Lena has a, a, a couple things that you could sign in and write into for them. So in the next few minutes, remember all of that, okay? Go in God's grace and peace.